found you. He googled his name and what happens next will make you quit the internet. There was a guy who out of boredom decided to google his own name. To his surprise he stumbled upon a website that had his full name as the domain. Curiosity peaked, he clicked the link and discovered a message board owned by someone with the same name, age and interest as him. The guy found it strange that both he and the website owner lived in the same city sharing a rare name. Strangely the coincidences only grew stronger. The website owner had a dog with the same name as his childhood pet, posted a picture of a car identical to the one he drove in college and even mentioned his favorite restaurant from a past job. Intrigued he decided to leave a message on the website only to realize it was a static page with no interactive features. So he sent an email to the owner expressing his surprise at the shared name. The following day the website vanished without a trace. His inbox however held a single chilling reply. So we know that people do fall into hot springs in Yellowstone, like the guy that completely dissolved in one in 2016. Most of these are completely accidental, but have you heard the story of Don Cressy? In 1975, a bunch of young employees at Yellowstone decided they were gonna sneak out one night and go into a hot spring. And they invited Don Cressy, who was a 21 year old chef who had worked in the park for three summers. But that night, Don never shows up to the party. Two days later, a small child stumbles upon his body floating in one of the hottest hot springs in the area. So the theory at the time was that Don had gotten into the wrong hot spring while trying to attend the party with his co-workers, and he accidentally jumped into one that boiled him alive. Here's the twist, and I talk about it in the episode. Not only was that hot spring not anywhere near where the party was taking place, but his car was not at the party. Someone had fully driven him there. Everyone who was at the party said that they never saw him show up, but he must have gotten there with someone. It was eventually ruled accidental, but his friends just felt like that never made sense. He had worked at the park for three summers and he knew it better than anyone. He knew to not get into that specific hot spring. Shocking war facts that school definitely didn't teach you. After the Mexican victory at the Alamo, General Santa Ana felt invincible. So much so that he allowed his soldiers to take a midday siesta. And that's when a single rank of the Texan army snuck up and defeated the entire Mexican army in 18 minutes. In 1944, when Queen Elizabeth was 18, she was a driver and automobile engine mechanic in an attempt to support the British war effort. During World War II, Japan built a battleship that was 862 feet long. It was so big in fact that when it was launched, it sent a four foot tidal wave that flooded Nagasaki. A Viking chief defeated an Italian city by pretending to convert to Christianity and die. Before his fake death, he requested that he be given a Christian burial in the city, so they let him in. Once the funeral procession was in, he popped out of his coffin and attacked the city from inside. The world's heaviest man was drafted to the US military at the age of 18. At the time, he weighed 709 pounds and couldn't even get to the draft office, so they came to him. His mother murdered her three kids during a psychosis episode. On January 24, 2023, 32-year-old Lindsay Clancy took the life of her five-year-old daughter, Cora, three-year-old son, Dawson, and seven-month-old baby, Callan. On this day, at 4.53 p.m., Lindsay asked her husband, Patrick, to pick up some dinner at a restaurant not too far from the house. About an hour later, Patrick returned home and noticed that there was absolute silence. He called for Lindsay's name, and after no response, he went into the bedroom and noticed that the window was open. Lindsay had jumped out the window in an attempt to take her own life but she was still alive this is where things get really sad patrick went to the basement and found all three kids with exercise cords around their necks both cora and dawson passed away in the hospital but baby callan passed away three days later due to his injuries Lindsay's defense attorney claims that she was suffering from postpartum psychosis which led her to break from reality and murder her children but the state attorney argues that these killings were premeditated and that Lindsay sent her husband to get food on purpose so that she can commit these crimes. However, Dr. Caney, who is a board member of Postpartum Support International, clarified that women can completely break with reality during violent episodes. She also said that women who are a few weeks postpartum should be aware of the symptoms of psychosis, which is usually hallucinating. Lindsay was charged with two counts of murder, three counts of strangulation and assault, and battery with a deadly weapon. And get this, she's currently paralyzed from the waist down after jumping out the window. I imported over a thousand to three hundred kilos of cocaine, then stabbed my cousin to death for money. My name is Quincy Proms, and my terrible story begins in January 2020, when the police chanced upon a colossal stash of cocaine, hidden away within a container at the port of Antwerp, Belgium. A few months later, in July, 
A family gathering took an unfortunate turn when I stabbed my cousin following a heated argument. What sparked this violent act? A drug deal gone sour. As per investigators, the early year drug haul was valued at a staggering 75 million euros. Despite already being wealthy, my relentless pursuit of more wealth led me to jeopardize my career. Today, the Public Prosecution Service of the Netherlands has requested a minimum two-year prison sentence for my actions. Horror movie facts that will haunt your nightmares. Coraline. The soundtrack in the movie is a French children choir singing. Surprisingly, they aren't actually singing in French. They're singing in a completely made-up language. If you look on the wall of the dining room in the other mother's home, you'll see three portraits of silhouettes. These likely represent the three ghost children that appear later in the film. In the normal world, the boy is sad and has dropped his ice cream. But in the other world, he's happy and his ice cream is perfect. Mr. Babinski's blue skin may appear to be a design choice, but the badge he wears pinned to his shirt has a dark meaning. It was actually a real medal given to those who helped clean up the site of the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster. So if Babinski helped with the cleanup, his skin could be blue due to the radiation exposure. The back of the chair above where Coraline's doll sits features a small flower-shaped pattern. And this flower is almost exactly like the one on the back of Jack Torrance's chair in The Shining. The welcome home cake features a double loop on the O. And according to graphology, a double loop on the lowercase O means that the person who wrote it is not telling the truth. But on the cake, there is actually only one double loop, meaning that Coraline is welcome, but she is not home. This is what we know about the four Idaho students who were murdered in their house. On November 13th at 12 p.m., four University of Idaho students were found stabbed to death in their beds in a home that they shared. The victims were 20-year-old Ethan, 21-year-old Kaylee, 21-year-old Madison, and 20-year-old Zaina. Just a few hours before Madison and Kaylee were murdered, at 1.40 a.m., they were seen on surveillance grabbing some food from a food truck in downtown Moscow. They then took an Uber home and at around 3 to 4 a.m. their lives were taken. Ethan and Zaina, who were a couple, also arrived to the home around the same time as Kaylee and Madison. There were also two other students in the home while the murder took place, but they were not harmed and they said they did not hear anything. These students in the home were also not the ones who called 911, but police will not release that information. Police do believe that this was a targeted and isolated attack, but they do not have any suspects at the moment. In my opinion, I think there's a lot more to this story and I hate to say it but these attacks seem really random and this may be a serial killer because fuck you that's why the tiktoker I just showed you is allegedly a pedophile and a murderer and he murdered a toddler just last year this is Tanner Horner a former FedEx driver and on social media he appeared to be the most normal guy you could imagine Tanner was always posting photos in goofy hats, cracking little jokes, making meaningless TikToks about his work life at FedEx and his life in general. But in December of 2022, he would commit one of the most atrocious acts you can imagine. On that day, he was out doing deliveries and he delivered a Christmas present, a package of Barbie dolls to the home of a seven-year-old girl named Athena Strand. Now, like I said, Athena was only seven years old on the day that she died. And according to Tanner, on that day, Athena was out in the street playing when he accidentally struck her with his FedEx truck. Now, he went to the girl, he was saying he's sorry, he didn't mean to hurt her, but when she woke up from her state of unconsciousness and told Tanner that she was gonna tell her father what had happened, he then proceeded to murder her with his bare hands. Tanner then hid the body in town and went on with his day. Shortly afterwards, though, he was arrested after witnesses placed him at the scene of the crime. And two days after he was arrested, he led the authorities right to the location of seven-year-old Athena's body. Now, this story is incredibly disturbing, not only because the TikTok video I showed you that he posted at the very beginning shows him in his FedEx uniform at the FedEx workplace, but Tanner Horner is also allegedly a pedophile. You see, he's being held in prison right now on murder charges, but he's also being held for four charges of SA against a child that stem back to 2013. Four charges. 
So this guy is obviously a scumbag. I know there's a lot more to the story that we're going to find out about soon, but since there's been no trial and no verdict, the details are still pretty slim. But I will update y'all once we learn more about this horrific crime. And that's the same person who pulled the trigger and took XXX Tentacion's life. 28-year-old Michael Boltwright along with Trayvon Newsom and Dedrick Williams were found guilty for the murder of XXX Tentacion on June 18, 2018. Surveillance footage captured these men blocking X's car as he tried to pull out from a motorcycle store parking lot. They came up to X's car and pointed a gun at him and then grabbed a bag full of money before shooting him. They took $50,000 in cash that X had just was taken out that same day. This guy named Robert Allen was also involved in the murder and robbery, but he testified against the three other men in order to get a lighter sentence. I don't know how true this is, but Robert stated that him and his friends decided that they were going to rob on that day, so when they spotted X, that's when they decided to make him the target. Like I'm dead, you killed me, I'm dead now. Shut up, Deku! Oh. This is TikToker Claire Miller, and in 2021, she stabbed her sister to death. So back in 2021, Claire Miller was your average 14-year-old girl. She was normal, she went to school, she had friends, and she posted a lot of videos on TikTok where she accrued a small fan base. There are even still pages to this day devoted to reposting her old TikToks and sharing them. But Claire had a dark side that nobody ever noticed. And that dark side would lash out in the worst imaginable way in 2021. So Claire had an older sister named Helen. She was 19, Claire was 14, and sadly Helen had cerebral palsy, which as you know is a debilitating disease. But for some reason on February 2nd, 2021, Claire snapped. She grabbed a knife inside of her house and stabbed her 19 year old sister, Helen, in the neck. Claire then called the police to turn herself in and was hysterical on the phone, claiming, I killed my sister, you need to come here now. And when authorities arrived at her house, Claire was standing out front, she was covered in blood, there was blood in the snow, and her sister was found inside of the home with a knife still inside of her neck. Authorities have gone on the record after this murder and stated how this case is so unusual because it was a sister murdering her older sister, and Claire was so young when she committed this crime, she was only 14 years old. Now, obviously, Claire's parents were horrified to find out that this had happened. They not only lost one of their daughters, but they lost their other daughter, too, because she was then arrested. And even though her attorneys tried to get this case moved to juvenile court, that motion was denied. And even though after her trial was found that Claire was mentally ill, she was sentenced to 12 and a half years to 40 years in prison after a third degree murder conviction. This story, once again, just goes to show that you can't ever really tell who a person is based on what they post on social media, because you could never tell by Claire's post that she was about to murder her own sister. I mean, just take a look at this final video. I was murdered by a 14-year-old when I was only two and a half years old. My name is Leah, and this is my story. I grew up in Mariu, in the north of France, with my older sister, with whom I am very close, and my parents. I live in a house next to my grandparents' house, where I spend a lot of time. These are sitting without family for years they take care of children who are entrusted to them by the social assistance to the child. They have in this case in the guard of Florian since 2015, a young man of 14 years. They quickly realize that he has a worrying behavior and thus alert the social services which had hidden things to them. Months pass and Florian's behavior worsens, he tries to set fire to his room, he walks around the house at night, he opens the gas in the middle of the night, ye field and notably was found naked in the room of another wall kept. My grandparents multiplied the reports, but they remained unanswered. Most of their alerts have been deleted and the medical psychological center where he stays during the week does nothing either. The reason for Florian's placement has also been hidden from them. Because of this situation, the grandparents no longer sleep at night. My life was turned upside down on the 21st of May 2019 while I was playing in my grandparents' garden. At about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, my whole family starts to look for me and thinks that I have hidden myself to play. 
Florian makes some disturbing remarks to another teenager. My grandfather went around the house and decided to go check at the bottom of the garden. He then discovered my inert body in the river. I had been raped and stabbed 22 times. The frightened cries of my grandfather alerted the neighbors who called the fire department and tried to resuscitate me, but to no avail. At the same time, Florian fled and was only found the next day. He is not called back, but does he even put a smile on his face? He is quickly placed in custody for voluntary manslaughter on an hour under 15 years old. The trial of Florian is held on June 13, 2009 in camera. This one is complex. Because the teenager confessed the facts, but does not recognize the gravity of it because of his psychological disorders. He is finally condemned to eight years of prison only because of this alteration of the discernment, which causes the anger of my family. Since then, my grandparents do not take care of their children and are fighting to prevent such an act from happening again. He also wants the responsibility of the social services that did not act in the situation to be established. We're always told to drink a lot of water throughout the day, but have you ever wondered what happens when you drink too much water? Well, 35-year-old Ashley Summers drank 64 ounces of water in a span of 20 minutes and passed away from water toxicity. Ashley, her husband, and two daughters were at Lake Freeman in Indiana when she began feeling dehydrated. So she drank four bottles of water because for some reason she wasn't able to quench her thirst. Ashley complained about having a horrible headache and she began to feel lightheaded. When she got home with her family, she passed out in the garage and she was taken to the hospital where the doctor said she had brain swelling. Ashley never woke up and she was pronounced dead from water toxicity. A toxicologist said that this is more likely to happen to someone who's extremely dehydrated, which will cause them to drink too much water and not enough sodium or electrolytes. So remember, bring more than just water on really hot days, especially if you're under the sun for a long period of time. For years, Dee Dee Blanchard told her friends, family, doctors about her daughter Gypsy's failing health. She convinced them that she was dying of leukemia, muscular dystrophy, numerous other diseases. And for 20 years, Gypsy dealt with medical procedures, homeschool, and isolation from the outside world. In reality, she was healthy and her mother was the one who was sick. On June 14th, 2015, a shared Facebook account between Gypsy Rose and her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard, named Dee Gyp Blanchard, posted this status. That is dead. It was the last thing friends and neighbors expected from Dee Dee and Gypsy. Dee Dee knocked on the hotel room door with a forged birth certificate saying Gypsy was only 15 and threatened to call the police. That escape attempt made Dee Dee chain her to her bed for two weeks and smash her computer with a hammer. She threatened it would be her fingers next if she ever tried that again. Dee Dee got pregnant with Gypsy when she was 24 after sleeping with 17-year-old Rod Blanchard.
This is probably every parent's worst nightmare. It all started on June 2013 when eight-year-old Cherish and her mother Rain and two younger sisters went to Dollar General in Jacksonville and met a man named Donald Smith. You see, Rain struggled financially and when she couldn't afford to buy Cherish a dress that she really wanted, Donald overheard this and then offered to take her and her daughters to Walmart on a shopping spree. Donald then offered to give Rain and her daughters a ride to Walmart and she accepted. But when they arrived to Walmart, Walmart, Donald was making very inappropriate comments to Cherish. And as the store was closing, he offered to go to the McDonald's in the Walmart and buy everyone some food. And he asked that Cherish come with him. Surveillance footage shows them leaving Walmart and clearly Cherish looks comfortable around this person and she doesn't think he's a threat. Rain said that the store started to close and there was still no sign of Cherish and Donald. So she spent about 20 minutes looking for them until she called the police. They issued an Amber Alert and finally at 9.05, a.m. they spotted Donald driving his white van and they stopped him but Cherish was not in the car. When Donald was brought into custody he was wearing the same clothes and he was all wet but he told police that he was doing drugs all night and that causes him to sweat. But sadly that same morning Cherish's body was found at the bottom of a creek behind a church. She suffered very horrific injuries and this is a trigger warning. Cherish suffered blunt force trauma to the head. She was strangled hard and she suffered a lot lot of injuries in her genital area. It turns out that Donald was a registered sex offender and he was released from prison only three weeks prior and he was charged and sentenced to death. Now what's disturbing is a conversation he had with his mother in prison that was recorded and he basically told her that Cherish followed him outside of the Walmart so he had no option but to get rid of her. I heard a scream coming from my sister. I heard a thud. Okay, could you describe this sound for Okay, it was about this loud. And then I just, I, I, I just panicked. All right, now, did you get up at that time to investigate what had happened? No, I did not. And could you tell the jury why you didn't? Because I was extremely afraid of my father, and I always have. This is 12-year-old Collier Landry, the only witness in a murder case involving his own father, Dr. Jack Boyle. How long were you and Noreen married? Uh, almost 20 years. And allegedly her body was found under my uh, basement in a uh, new home in Erie, Pennsylvania on January 25th. Any children? Uh, yes, uh, one, one natural child, uh, Collier. How does he feel about all this? I mean, this... Well, he's very distraught. He was manipulated by uh, David Messmore of the Mansfield Police Department and a few other people. So the child basically was brainwashed into thinking his daddy's a murderer. Collier sidled up to me and he started whispering. And he said, uh, my mother would never leave me. This is not right. My mother would never do this. In our line of work, we call that a clue. Compelled to fight his own father, 12-year-old Collier Landry didn't hesitate to face off against the local police department, the media, and even his own family to find his mother. With a little help from one dissident detective, he summoned his courage and started investigating on his own. But little did he know, he was also on the list of his father's future victims. The thing that was overwhelming that fear was my desire to find out what happened to my mother and get justice for her. In the city of Mansfield, Ohio, Known for its steelwork and heavy industry, 11-year-old Collier lives with his father Jack, his mother Noreen, and his newly adopted sister, Elizabeth. At the time, Jack's by far the most successful doctor in town. He had what the investigators called the largest medical practice in Richland County. Uh, one out of 13 people used Dr. Boyle as their physician. But behind closed doors, Jack was a completely different person. Described as a rageaholic by his wife, the man has a quick temper and often goes off without a warning. One day, while Collier was sitting in the living room playing video games, he fell victim to one of his father's bouts. He just started ripping off all the games and throwing them at my head. Then he started making me call myself a stupid little fat boy. He'd say, what are you? And, I, and I'd say, a stupid little fat boy. And he'd say even louder, he'd say, what are you? And I said, a stupid little fat boy. This clip was from 1990. At the time, Collier was still a child, but as an adult, he isn't shy of saying the actual words his father used to torture him psychologically. My father called me a pussy and a little fat and all these derogatory terms, you know, not to use the word of the day, but this is truly toxic masculinity, treating your son this way. 
but his other faults were hardly a secret to anyone. Everybody in town knew of his infidelities, and Jack never had to face the consequences of his actions until the day he casually introduced his latest girlfriend to his own son. My dad got out and he says, well, look who's here, it's Sherry. Then um, I turned to Sherry and I looked at her hand and she had a ring on. And I turned to her and I said, Sherry, my mother has a ring like that. After Collier noticed the ring, he knew he had to tell Noreen. I knew I was in an impossible position. I said, Mom, please sit down. There's something I have to tell you. I think Daddy has... That's how drunk I felt, off of one drink. September 13th, the next morning, Ashley wakes up with a horrible hangover. She goes to school, comes back, and again, Stacy suggests for them to drink. This time, she says, let's get really drunk. I could taste the vodka and it, it was very strong and it made me cringe and I asked her if she could take it back and put either more orange juice in it or more Sprite in it. Stacy goes into the kitchen and brings her a straw. She tells her to put the straw into the back of her throat and to just drink it. Ashley does as her mother says and passes out. Later that evening, Bree comes back to find out her sister has been sleeping all day. I opened the door a little bit. My mom came out of like nowhere and closed the door. She's fine. I'm like, really? And, and like to me, that was weird. Right then and there, I was like, are you sure she's okay? Mom's like, she's sleeping and I hope she sleeps through the entire night. The next morning, Bree hears a strange noise coming from Ashley's room. She was making that noise when she was breathing out. And her eyes were all glassed over and she had thrown up. And I called her name and she didn't answer me. And I shook her and she didn't wake up. Even though she wasn't like responding to anything, she looked scared. Did you think that you were losing her? I did. If it weren't for her sister Bree, Ashley would have died in her bed 10 minutes later. When Ashley wakes up in the hospital, both her and her sister Bree come face to face with a shocking new reality. Their mother just attempted to kill Ashley. When I woke up and saw that police officer standing there, I absolutely knew that I didn't do it. And she was the only one there, so it had to have been her. Upon hearing Ashley's story, District Attorney Fitzpatrick gives the order to immediately put Stacy Castor under arrest. We made the conscious decision to arrest her right there on the property of the hospital. But a Liverpool woman tonight is charged with killing her husband, and investigators say it appears this is not the first time. What shocked the community was the idea that a mother would attempt to murder her own daughter to save her own skin to blame her for the murders of her two husbands. What could be more basic than a mother's love for her child? January 13th, 2009, Stacy Castor's trial begins. One year after her mother tried to kill her and frame her for murder, Ashley shows up in court. The prosecutor is District Attorney William Fitzpatrick. He's been preparing Ashley for this moment, but she's faced with an incredible challenge. Come face to face with her mother in court, the woman she trusted all her life and who betrayed her. There were other parts of me that are still the little kid and were afraid of that mom look she was going to give me, like, I am so disappointed in you that you're up there testifying against me. The worst part is, Stacy Castor's only defense is to convince the jury that Ashley killed both her fathers. All Stacy needs is reasonable doubt from one jury, and she walks free. Fitzpatrick makes the bold move of calling Ashley to the witness stand as the first witness. I want to ask you about the day your dad died. I saw him take and lift his arm up, and then he made a breath, and then he didn't move again after that. So I thought he was just sleeping. As Ashley tells her story, she's visibly upset. I wanted to be sitting right next to her and holding her hand and helping her, and she shouldn't have had to go through that alone. As the hour passes, Fitzpatrick then leads her to talk about the night her mother tried to poison her. She came home and she was like, let's get drunk. Let's get just totally drunk. Now, Ashley, I want you to explain to the jury if the cup tasted bad and you didn't enjoy it, why would you drink it? Because I trusted her. What's the next thing you remember? Waking up in the hospital with a detective asking me what I did. 
What did you drink? What did you do? What did you take? What did you write in that note? But I didn't know what he was talking about, because I didn't write a note, and I didn't take anything. The trial lasts for three long weeks. The evidence against Stacy Castor is overwhelming. Investigators collected forensic evidence from the home computer. It shows the letter was finished on September 12th at 2.27 p.m. Ashley couldn't have written that letter because she was at school. In fact, it was the same day she called her mom at home in a panic.